Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam <coughs> Canto 5 um, Chapter 26, Text 18 As translated with commentaries by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami <coughs> Prabhupada, the founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And this is a continuation of Sukadeva Goswami's conversation with Maharaj Parikshit, which took place approximately 5,000 years ago on the banks of the Ganges <clears throat> as the king was preparing to leave his body, die, leave his body. And this particular section, like Sugadeva Swami is describing so many, um, everything, it's giving him all information, full knowledge, full bliss, full <clears throat> access to the transcendental, eternal, spiritual realm. And, uh, but in this particular section, he's describing the, um, the planets that are below the lowest planetary system. And those planets in the universe are the hellish planets. And they are managed and supervised by Yamarash, who is a servant of the Lord, and that's his duty. So those jiva souls who uh, transgress the, the way everything is set up by the Lord in the material world, there are laws and rules for conduct and behavior in the material world and those living entities who are rebellious to the system as it's set up uh, they get re they have to be <clears throat> their consciousness needs to be rectified anyone who comes to the material world it's described is already rebellious because we're spirit we're not matter <clears throat> and as soon as a spiritual being who is eternal, full of knowledge, blissful, is never born, never dies, doesn't get old, doesn't get diseased, but as soon as they, that living entity wants to exercise independence from the Lord, then, and they want to act like the Lord acts, the Lord is completely independent, and the minute living entities have minute independence, have the independence of uh, their individuals, unique individuals. So they are, in one sense, we are, we have a kind of independence. It's a limited independence, and it can manifest in we want to exercise it as if it wasn't minute, but we want to exercise it as if it was complete independence, then the spirit spark turns away from the, from the very source of their own spiritual energy, <coughs> becomes, uh, wants to be completely independent, which is not possible because of the type of energy that we are. We're minute, we're very small. And they don't like that. If someone doesn't like that, they want to be big, big, big. Then the arrangement is to uh, perform their activities in the material energy, material world. And so we see a great display of busy work, making things, building things, huge skyscrapers, inventions, uh, and that's from that 
desire to be big, powerful, the controller, the enjoyer, and also the friend of everyone. Everyone should, should love me, <laughs> please me. I'm the center of everything. So to one degree or another, everyone in the material world has this mentality, forgetting their actual nature, which is very small. And so they get birth after birth, life after life, material body, material mind, and act out this, this fantasy, this illusion. It's a fantasy, it's an illusion within the material energy, like uh, children playing in a sandbox. My truck, my steam shovel, <laughs> it is sand in a sandbox. So to help such living entities, it's not over there, it's right here. It's all of us, <laughs> the material world. Anyone who's subject to birth, death, old age, and disease, that's who, that's who we are. We're the conditioned souls in the material, trying to act out these things in the material world. So there are laws within the material energy, and if such a rebellious spirit can at least follow the guidebook and the laws for peaceful life, <clears throat> then that's a step in the right direction. At least they're following some, uh, submitting to some higher authority, even if it's just a ritualistic kind of thing or if their motivation is simply so they can enjoy better. It's not even to please the Lord, but just so they can. That's all right, at least they're following something. But there are those rebellious living entities who they came to the material world to um, control and be independent, and so they don't even follow the rule book and the guidebook for peaceful, prosperous life in the material world with the opportunity to actually begin to ask the right questions. Who am I? What am I doing here? And why am I suffering? Because there's always suffering in the material world, even if somebody follows the rules. Well, for one thing, no one can follow the rules perfectly anyway. It's so intricate. The laws of material nature are so intricate. So there's always a reaction for everything. But the actions, reactions are minimized when somebody tries to follow the rules. The reactions are minimized. But there are those living entities who they have no intention to follow any rules. They want to do what they want to do based on this rebellious spirit. And so they cause, they, they perform what's called sinful activities. They hurt other people, other living entities. They're destructive. Um, they cause a big disturbance. So <clears throat> they're allowed to go on like that and do their nonsense. Um, what can be done, it's their free will. They've made that choice and they're misusing it. But after the body is is through, that particular body is through, actually in order to help them, they get to spend some time in Yamaraj's domain, the hellish planets, and they get some punishment. They get the reactions for their activities. There's a reaction. It's like if you put your hand in the fire, it gets burned. Nobody's picking on you. <laughs> it's just the way it is. So these hellish planets are there when people do certain things and there's a reaction. And the idea is that the, it, so these hellish planets are so miserable that at least the, they'll be rectified in their behavior in that put two and two together. Oh, I did this, now I have to suffer this reaction. Oh no, next time I won't do that. And so they begin to accept that there are higher authorities. There is a higher authority. Otherwise, why are they suffering so much? And then they might even start to ask some questions. Why am I suffering? Oh, 
who's made these laws and rules? And why can't I just do whatever I want to do and not have to suffer? So these are um, these are the different planets. And there are many of them. This is uh, text 18. And Sukadev continues, a person is considered no better than a crow if, after receiving some food, he does not divide it among guests, old men and children, simply eats it himself, or if he eats it without performing the five kinds of service. After death, he's put into the most abominable hell known as Krimi Bojana. In that hell is a lake 100,000 yojanas, which equals 800,000 miles wide and filled with worms. Yeah. He becomes a worm in that lake and feeds on the other worms there who also feed on him. Unless he atones for his actions before death, such a sinful remain, remains in the hellish lake of creamy bojana for many years as there are bojanas in the width of the lake. He becomes a worm and he has to, f he eats the other worms, and they also eat him. So his punishment is because he did something about food. He didn't divide it among guests, old men, and children. He was very greedy and uh, selfish. He didn't perform any kinds of sacrifice. He just... So this is a pretty severe punishment, I wouldn't think. But he didn't share his food. He didn't distribute any of it. He just kept it all for himself. So he becomes a worm. Hmm. It's a sinful mentality. Hmm. Now, Devotees aren't like that. They, um, they offer their food to Krishna and they're happy to distribute it because they know it pleases Krishna. Krishna Prashadam. Mm. Hey, Krishna. Krishna Prashadam. And also, even up until recently, and maybe even now in some of the villages, um, when a family, their meal was prepared, um, a householder, uh, you call out into the street, anyone who's hungry, come and take some food. Come and take a meal. Not that they were just feeding, you know, <clears throat> people who are loafers that lived in the village, but sometimes someone may be traveling and, they, and they're hungry, they don't have any food, and a pilgrim or someone traveling. And so calling out like that, come and take your meal, come and take your meal, like that. So kind-hearted. We're talking about spirit here. It's not... We are spirit, and spirit behaving like that is very pleasing to the Supreme Spirit. Krishna, supreme spiritual being. It's an unnatural condition, this material condition is unnatural. To all living entities, it's an unnatural condition. <clears throat> We're spiritual beings. So that's an exchange of love to share food. So we get to practice here the material world. Prabhupada's commentary. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, yagna shishta shina santo vuchante sarvakyo basai unjate te tragam papa ya pachant yat makaranat The devotees of the Lord are released from all kinds of sins because they eat food which is first offered for sacrifice Others who prepare food for personal sense enjoyment verily eat only sin. 
All food is given to us by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Eko bahunam yo vidhati kaman. The Lord supplies everyone with the necessities of life. <clears throat> Therefore, we should acknowledge his mercy by performing yagna or sacrifice. This is the duty of everyone. Indeed, the sole purpose of life is to perform yagna. Yeah, okay. So, Krishna is supplying food to everyone. So the devotees, they offer, make an offering to the Lord before they eat. And so the, their sinful reaction is not there because they're taking mercy of the Lord. According to Krishna, Yagnartat karmanonyatra lokoyam karmabandana tadartam karmakanteya mukta sangha samachara. Work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed. Otherwise, work binds one to this material world. Therefore, O son of Kunti, perform your prescribed duties for his satisfaction, and in that way you will always remain unattached and free from bondage. If we do not perform yagna and distribute prasad to others, our lives are condemned. Only after performing yagna and distributing prasad to all dependents, children, brahmins, and old men, should one eat. However, one who cooks only for himself or his family is condemned, along with everyone he feeds. After death, he's put into the hell known as Krimi Bojana. Hmm. That's why hearing from the pure devotee just drives the message home. <laughs> Jai, Srila Prabhupada. Uh, work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed. Hmm. So, offering foodstuff to the Lord. And then distribute to others. Hmm. some pretty serious punishment for that. Text 19. <clears throat> My dear king, a person who in the absence of an emergency robs a Brahmin, or indeed anyone else, of his gems and gold, is put into a hell known as Sadamsa. There his skin is torn and separated by red-hot iron balls and tongs. In this way his entire body is cut to pieces. In the absence of an emergency, robs a Brahmin or anyone else of his gems and gold. His skin is torn and separated by red hot iron balls and tongs. His body is cut into pieces. Hmm. Pretty serious stuff. Pretty serious stuff. Hmm. Text 20. A man or woman who indulges in sexual intercourse with an unworthy member of the opposite sex is punished after death by the assistance of Yamaraj in the hell known as Tapta Surmi. There such men and women are beaten with whips. The man is forced to embrace a red hot iron form of a woman, and the woman is forced to embrace similar form of a man, such as the punishment for illicit sex. And when we're reading about the punishment for robbing a Brahmin, I I can't I when I look at that I don't see the connection of the what the punishment tearing the skin with red hot iron tongs and tearing him to pieces for stealing something from a Brahmin. You don't see how it connects the, that particular punishment, but when we look at this, it kind of makes sense. If uh, people, a man or a woman, engages in sexual intercourse illicitly and because it's so lusty to do that, then they get to embrace a red-hot iron form of a man or a woman. I mean, that kind of makes sense. 
that that particular punishment for that particular transgression. Do you want me to put the punishment with the with the crime? The crime. <coughs> Prabhupada's commentary. <clears throat> Generally, a man should not have sexual relations with any woman other than his wife. According to Vedic principles, the wife of another man is considered one's mother. The sexual relations are strictly forbidden with one's mother, sister, or daughter. If one indulges in illicit sexual relations with another man's wife, that activity is considered identical with having sex with one's mother. This is most sinful. Same principle holds for a woman also. If she enjoys sex with a man other than her husband, the acts is tantamount to having sexual relations with her father or son. Illicit sex life is always forbidden, and any man or woman who indulges in it is punished in the manner described in this verse. Uh, this material world is uh, such a dangerous place. Well, is it, it's not a fit place for a lady or a gentleman. Text 21. A person who indulges in sex indiscriminately, even with animals, is taken after death to the hell known as Rajakantika Salmali. In this hell, there is a silk cotton tree full of thorns as strong as thunderbolts. The agents of Yamaraj hang the sinful man on that tree and pull him down forcibly so that the thorns very severely tear his body. Yeah, that would make sense because these are all misuses of um, sex activity. These are all deviations from the plan of Supreme Being, Supreme Lord. So for the man and the woman in the previous verse who are having uh, in inappropriate sex, sexual behavior with members of the opposite sex, and they got to embrace the red heart iron form. But here, if someone is so lusty that they want to enjoy some sex feelings with animals, then they get dragged down a tree full of thorns. Yeah. There's the objects of their lust isn't a, a man or a woman, it's the, the lusting after animals. So they get the tree of thorns. Prabhupada's commentary. The sexual urge is so strong that sometimes a man indulges in sexual relations with a cow or woman indulges in sex relations with a dog. Such men and women are put into the hell known as Vajrakanti Salmali. The Krishna consciousness movement forbids illicit sex. From the description of these verses, we can understand that an extremely sinful act illicit sex is. Sometimes people disbelieve these descriptions of hell, but whether one believes or not, everything must be carried out by the laws of nature, which no one can avoid. Yeah. So these punishments are there for persons who they absolutely cannot control these urges. And for one reason or another, they behave like this. And so if you get punished, then you might make some effort to try not to do what caused the punishment. Of course, the higher principle is to get a higher taste. Um, because this doesn't really work. <laughs> These punishments don't really work. Uh, we see people get punished and then they try to behave properly and then they just fall right back in or perform something else uh, equally as abominable until someone gets a higher taste. When they get a higher taste of the real spirit self, and they're not identifying with the body and the mind, the sex urges, the urges of the tongue, the belly, the genitals, 
words, the urge to speak, anger. You don't identify with these things. They identify with the spiritual being in connection with the Lord who's situated within their own heart. They make that connection with Super Soul. Then they're not subject to being confused or dragged around by the senses. This is Goswami, one who controls the senses. And the spiritual master, the enlightened souls, they're the external manifestation of the super soul within the heart. So all help is there, external and internal, to get distance or detachment from identification with the material body and the difficulties associated with these different pullings and pushings of the senses. So the sex desire is there, and the arrangement is to become responsible. Take one partner, man take a woman, woman take a man, and take responsibility for the children that will be produced from the sex relations and raise them nicely, give them all opportunity to become devotional, to re realize their spiritual nature, transcend the cycle of birth and death. So it's a nice arrangement if we accept it. If we don't accept it, then you get to uh, go to places like Rajra Kantaka, Salmali, and have a good ride many, many times down the tree full of thorns. <laughs> or have a nice hug with a red heart iron form of a man or a woman. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what can be done, you know? <laughs> Makes sense. Text 22. A person who is born into a responsible family, such as a Kshatriya, a member of royalty or a government servant, but who neglects to execute his prescribed duties according to religious principles, and who thus becomes degraded, falls down at the time of death into the river of hell known as Vaitarani. This river, which is a moat surrounding hell, is full of ferocious aquatic animals. When a sinful man is thrown into the river Vaitarani, the aquatic animals there immediately begin to eat him. Because of his extremely sinful life, he does not leave his body. He constantly remembers his sinful activities and suffers terribly in that river, which is full of stool, urine, pus, blood, hair, bones, marrow, flesh, and fat. Oh, it sounds like, sounds like what this body is made of. <laughs> Isn't that? I mean, what this body is? Stool, urine, pus, blood, hair, nails, bones, marrow, flesh, and fat? Well, you thought it was so nice <laughs> to live in and to use. <laughs> well, why don't you think this river is nice? I mean, that's, it, that's what this body's made of. Oh, you think the body is so nice, looking in the mirror and fixing the hair and dressing it and feeding it and pampering it and putting it in a nice place to rest. <laughs> so why would this river be so bad? It's all the things the body's made of. But when it's combined like that, it's not so nice when it's combined like this, and I can use it to try to uh, enjoy sensually through the material, na in the material nature, oh, then it's very nice. But when it's a river and I can't get out of it, and it's all the elements are just floating around in there, it's obnoxious. 
is not a cesspool, but they're both cesspools. <laughs> it's just it's more obvious when it's the Vaitarani River. And he says there are animals there, I begin to eat him. Uh, so the, what this person did that got him into the Vaitarani River is that he was a, had a, a born into a responsible position. He was expected to become a member of the government who takes care of the citizens in exchange uh, is supported in life with a very opulent lifestyle, everything he needs. He exacts taxes from his citizens, and he sees to the protection and to the uh, orderly functioning of society that no one is causing a disturbance either from outside or from inside. But if such a person neglects to do those duties according to religious principles, becomes degraded, then he goes into the Vaitarani. Because he's living off other people. He's living off his citizens. And if he's neglects to take care of them and instead becomes degraded, debauched or whatever, then he has to go to this Vaitarani River to get to get his uh, rewards. Of course, people perform pious activities, they get rewarded, they go to the heavenly planets. When people perform sinful activities, they get to go to the the hellish planets. It's a system of reward and punishment in the material world. But it's a cycle. It goes on and on and on, endlessly, up and down, up and down, around and around. It's the wheel of samsara. <clears throat> so the only way to get out of this system of punishment and reward is by accessing the devotional energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then Yamaraj has no jurisdiction. Because this is strictly for those who are in material consciousness. This is not for devotees. Well, devotees don't perform these kinds of activities. Or if they do, they very quickly get rectified. What is it? Even if one commits the most abominable actions, if he's engaged in devotional service, very shortly becomes righteous, which means he gets rectified. Once that bhakti begins to awaken within the heart and that desire to go back home, back to Godhead, become liberated from the material concept of life and the desire to serve the Lord, to return home, then even if they make some mistake, they'll become confused or sidetracked or bad habit or they become rectified. Very shortly becomes rectified. So these hills, they're not for, well, that's the power of devotional service. These are not for devotees. These are for non-devotees. This is for those who are identifying with the material body as the self. Text 23. Mm. Shameless husbands of low-born Sudra women live exactly like animals, and they have no good behavior, cleanliness, or regulated life. After death, such persons are thrown into the hell called Puyoda, where they are put into an ocean filled with pustule, urine, mucus, saliva, and similar things. Sudras who could not improve themselves fall into that ocean and are forced to eat those disgusting things. Oh boy, they get to taste pus, stool, urine, mucus, saliva, and so on. So, live exactly like animals. No good behavior, no cleanliness, a regulated life. So this is, when we say sudras, 
if a devotee is uh, their natural propensities for serving our sudra, it is not talking about a devotee who had to maintain themselves. They have sudra behavior, sudra. Not, that's not what's being talked about here. This is shameless husbands of low-born sudra women who behave like animals. So devotees don't behave like animals. Maybe they have some quote-unquote sudra occupation. Maybe they support themselves by menial tasks, menial labor, um, construction, or whatever. So it's menial labor. It's not a Vaishya or a Chatriya or a Brahmin. Or they have to serve someone else. They're a clerk in a, in a store or they're like this. Yes, it's Sudra behavior, but they're not shameless husbands of low-born Sudras who act exactly like animals. That's <laughs> not... That's not, but the materialistic sudra like this, they got a problem. It's pretty nasty. Prabhupada's commentary. Srila Nartam das Thakura's song. Karma kanda jnana kanda kevala vishara bandha amrita balaya eva pakaya nana yoni sada pure kadarya Bhakshanakari, Tara Janma Ada Patayaya. This is Bengali. He says that persons following the paths of Karmakanda and Jnanakanda, fruit of activities and speculative thinking, are missing the opportunities for human birth and gliding down into the cycle of birth and death. Thus, there was always a chance that he may be put into the Priyoda Naraka, the hell named Priyoda, where one is forced to eat stool, urine, pus, mucus, saliva, and other abominable things. It is significant that this verse is spoken especially about sudras. If one is born a sudra, he must continually return to the ocean of Priyoda to eat horrible things. Thus, even a born sudra is expected to become a Brahmin. That's the meaning of human life. Hmm. Everyone should improve himself. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Chaturvanyam Mayashastam Gunakarma Vibhagasa. So here Prabhupada says, see this is why we like to hear from the pure devotee. Even the Sudra is to expect it to improve themselves. Hmm. Hmm. Krishna. According to the three modes of material nature and the work ascribed to them, four divisions of human society were created by me. Even if one is by qualification a sudra, he must try to improve his position, become a Brahmin. No one should try to check a person, no matter what his present position is, from coming to the platform of a Brahmin or a Vaishnav. Actually, one must come to the platform of a Vaishnav. Then he automatically becomes a Brahmin. This can be done only if the Krishna consciousness movement is spread, for we're trying to elevate everyone to the platform of Vaishnav. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Sarvadaman Parichacha Mamikam Saranambraja, abandon all other duties, simply surrender unto me. One must give up the occupational duties of a Sudra Kshatriya Vaishya and adopt the occupational duties of a Vaishnav, which include the activities of a Brahmin. And Krishna explains this in Bhagavad Gita. Mami parta viyapasrita, ye pishu papayonaya, striyo vaishas tadasudas, tepiyanti paramgatim. O son of Pita, those who take shelter in me, though they be of lower birth, women, vaishas, merchants, as well as sudras, workers, can approach the supreme destination. Human life is specifically meant for going back home, back to Godhead. This facility should be given to everyone, whether one be a Sudra, Vaishya, woman, Kshatriya. This is the purpose of the Krishna consciousness movement. However, if one is satisfied to remain a Sudra, he must suffer as described in this verse. Hmm. Yeah, so there's different ways to look at this. Um,
So Brahman means very clean and, and self-control and peaceful. So and Sudra generally, as we were hearing in the verse, means to live like an animal, totally unregulated, all kinds of sinful activities. So such a person who is born into this sudra, so such a person is, is not qualified for a responsible position of leadership or managing things like land and cows or finances, banking or trade, because they're unregulated and they're living like an animal. So here Prabhupada is, is making it clear that even such a person no one should stop such a person from trying to make a, improve themselves. And he further goes on to say that that's the purpose of the Krishna consciousness movement, is to give opportunity to everyone. Sudra can come to Krishna consciousness and get training to improve themselves. can have a sudra who is a Vaishnav, becomes a Vaishnav. Doesn't necessarily mean their occupation changes, that they're not a, in order to support the family, that they may be still engaged in serving others, because a Vaishya will never serve anyone else, and a Chatriya won't serve anyone else. And a Brahmin won't serve anyone else. They have their own occupations. And the Sudras, they assist. But if the Sudra is also a Vaishnav, then this is, uh, they're offering the, act act the results of all their activities and all their work and everything they do and eat, they're offering to Krishna. They're actually a Vaishnav. So it's, it's open to everyone. So no one should block someone who's coming from a very difficult place with a, a sudra environment, sudra family, sudra mentality. No one should block someone like that from taking up the practices of Krishna consciousness. This is Lord Chaitanya's movement. He's come for everyone. Sudra, Vaisha, Chatriya, Brahman, he's come for everyone. So. Women, Vaishas, Sudras can approach the supreme destination. Sriyo Vaishas, Tada Sudras, Tepi Anti Parangati. Text 24. But if they don't, then they've got this wonderful Pioda hellish planet to take a little vacation spot on. <laughs> Text 24. If in this life a man of the higher classes, Brahman, Kshatri, and Vaisha, is fond of taking his pet dogs, mules, or asses into the forest to hunt and kill animals unnecessarily, He's placed after death into the hell known as Pranaroda. There the assistants of Yamaraj make him their targets and pierce him with arrows. Yeah, so this hunting unnecessarily the animals in the forest is very sinful activity. And they get to go to Pranaroda and the agents of Yamaraj make him their targets. So, see what it's like? There you go. You get to see what it's like, shoot arrows at you. So, this is very popular sport. People go unnecessarily to, you know, to uh, on African safaris, or they go into the wooded areas, unnecessarily. Now, Arjuna was also going hunting, and many of the great kings, they would go hunting, but it was 
to improve their skills for fighting. Because they had in battle, they would have to face formidable enemies. So they would, but they would also eat what they killed. It wasn't just for sport. And the animals were sacrificed in this way for the prowess of the of the Kshatriya, for the warrior. It was a kind of sacrifice. So that's not what's being talked about here. Prabhupada's commentary. In the Western countries, especially, aristocrats keep dogs and horses to hunt animals in the forest. Whether in the West or the East, aristocratic men in the Kali Yuga adopt the fashion of going to the forest and unnecessarily killing animals. Men of the higher classes, the Brahmin, Kshatriyas, and Vaishyas, should cultivate knowledge of Brahman, and they should also give the Sudras a class to come to that platform. If instead they indulge in hunting, they're punished as described in this verse. Not only are they pierced with arrows by the agents of Yamaraj, but they're also put into the ocean of pus urine stool described in the previous verse. Mm. So the behavior, they're meant to cultivate, these are people in the higher classes, if they're, they're meant to cultivate, see, the previous, in the previous verse, it's being described how a sudra who's already on the bottom, if he doesn't make advancement to improve himself in his life, then he gets punished for that, he's supposed to make advancement. And here, these are the higher classes. They're a step above, step or two or three, above the sudra in terms of um, self-control or more facilities. They're just born into higher rungs of society. And if they behave like this, where they unnecessarily go into the forest and kill animals, that is a waste. Hmm. They're, they're degrading themselves. See, the is already degraded. He's supposed to upgrade himself. And these higher castes are supposed to help sudras to advance. But if they're, the higher castes are acting in these degraded ways, then they have to join the sudras in the, um, oh, what was that verse previously? Yeah, it's in the purport where Prabhupada reveals that. I was looking at the verse and I couldn't find what I was looking for. Prabhupada, it's in the purport. It says, men of the higher classes should cultivate knowledge of Brahman and give sutras a chance to come to that platform. But if they don't, instead they degrade themselves by this unnecessary sporting of hunting these innocent animals unnecessarily, then they get degraded they have to experience being hunted by the agents of Yamaraj, and they have to join the sudras in the ocean of pus, urine, stool, etc. So, say we're all in this together. <laughs> Text 25. A person who in this life is proud of his eminent position who needlessly sacrifices animals simply for material prestige, is put into the hell called Vishashan after death. There the assistants of Yamaraj kill him after giving him unlimited pain. So this is all in the, these, these verses are all in the category of causing pain and suffering to other living entities or being given responsibility for other living entities and not fulfilling it. That seems to be a theme running through this, to be uh, offensive to other living entities, other parts and parcels of the Lord. It's uh, a lesson to be learned, to be uh, respectful and nonviolent toward other living entities. Of course, on the spiritual platform, it goes much further than that. It's not just respect and 
but there's actual love. There's loving exchanges. There's no aggression in our, well, it's in play, but not, not this where you act, where they actually hurt somebody, or cause them pain and suffering, make their life more miserable than it needs to be. This is, this is violence. So we can see that theme running through, and it manifests in different ways. One way it manifests is the person who is responsible, Chatriya, doesn't perform his duties properly toward the other living entities. He causes them pain and suffering unnecessarily. His citizens are dependent on him. And he's been given that position. He doesn't fulfill it. He has to suffer. Another way is um, unnecessarily hunting the animals for sport. Then they have to suffer. They're causing pain and suffering. And then another is someone who's already degraded, who's already causing pain and suffering by their sinful activities, uh, eating things that, you know, causing pain and eating living entities or whatever it is they're doing, like chatri, like uh, sudra, because they're not bettering themselves. They have to suffer. So it comes down to how spiritual beings are relating to each other. They're relating to each other on a material platform, blind to the spiritual nature, and they cause pain and suffering to each other. And that's what's punishable. That's where the reaction is. Hmm. So this verse, again, we see that theme. A person in this life proud of his eminent position who heedlessly sacrifices animals simply for material prestige is put into a hell called Vishashan after death. There the assistants of Yamaraj kill him after giving him unlimited pain. Prabhupada's commentary. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Suchinam Srimatam Gehe Yoga Brasta Bijayate. Because of his previous connection with Bhakti Yoga, a man born into a prestigious family of Brahmins or aristocrats. Having taken such a birth, one should utilize it to perfect Bhakti Yoga. However, due to bad association, one often forgets that his prestigious position has been given to him by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, misuses it by performing various kinds of so-called yagnas like Kali Puja and Durga Puja, in which poor animals are sacrificed. How such a person is punished is described herein. The word Damba Yagneshu in this verse is significant. If one violates the Vedic instructions while performing yagna, and simply makes a show of sacrifice for the purpose of killing animals, he's punishable after death. In Calcutta, there are many slaughterhouses where animal flesh is sold that has supposedly been offered and sacrificed before the goddess Kali. The Shastras enjoin that one can sacrifice a small goat before the goddess Kali once a month. Nowhere is it said that one can maintain a slaughterhouse in the name of temple worship and daily kill animals unnecessarily. Those who do so receive the punishments described herein. Mm. It's all about not causing pain and suffering to other living entities, either by directly aggression or unnecessary slaughter, or by not doing one's duty and responsibility if they're given a responsible post, because that also causes pain and suffering. Okay, this is text 26. Now, these are very graphic sinful activities, and they're also very graphic punishments. So here it comes. <laughs> this is text 26. If a foolish member of the twice-born classes, Brahman, Shatri, and Vaisha, forces his wife to drink his semen out of a lusty desire to keep her under control, He's put after death into the hell known as Lalabaksha. There he's thrown into a flowing river of semen, which he is forced to drink. Oh, man. Hare Krishna. So, these things are going on. <laughs> it's going on. And this is the 
This is the punishment for that. Prabhupada's commentary. The practice of forcing one's wife to drink one's own semen is a black art practiced by extremely lusty persons. Those who practice this very abominable activity say that if a wife is forced to drink her husband's semen, she remains very faithful to him. Generally, only low-class men engage in this black art, but if a man born in a higher classes does so, after death he's put into the hell known as Lalabaksha. There he is immersed in the river known as Shukranadi and forced to drink semen. So there we see, you get to see what it's like. You get to see what that's like. So, Hare Krishna. You can see how this causes pain and suffering to another person out of a desire to control, lusty control. So that it's not very healthy for the person that they're trying to control. It's not healthy for the person who's trying to do the controlling. So again, how people relate to each other, materially or spiritually. Text 27. I'm kind of running out of time. Maybe we'll save this for another reading. And amongst, devi amongst devotees, that's why something called um, Vaishnava Parad is so dangerous. Here we see the conditioned souls offending how when we're in a conditioned state, we offend each other on a gross platform and a subtle platform, with the mind also we can offend. But we're held to task, especially if we enact some of these things out on the gross platform. Because we're causing pain to other living beings, we're not performing our duty or responsibility toward them, and that indirectly causes them pain and, and discomfort, it makes their life more miserable, more difficult, block their advancement, so that's on the material platform, the gross material platform. On the devotional platform, one who is people who are trying to make advancement spiritually to be offensive to each other is devastating. It blocks the devotional service. And there is a, a huge reaction for it one's devotional creeper dries up and they're again back down into material consciousness. So that is like the spiritual counterpart is this fault finding, find fault. It's an ocean of faults, material world. And those that are trying to make advancement, they're trying to improve themselves which means what? They're perfect already? No, it means they have shortcomings. They have misconceptions. They have problems controlling their mind, problems controlling their senses. They're struggling to make advancement and to surrender and to find fault with someone who's trying to better themselves. It uh, destroys one's own devotional creeper. So... It's uh, no fault insurance. <laughs> if there is some encounter, it's distasteful. Better not to find fault. Like they have that car insurance, no fault insurance. <laughs> it just happened. Now let's get past it. Do what we need to do. Be Krishna conscious. No fault.